This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Christmas in the Holy Land, a special program on the greatest story ever told, a unique look at Bethlehem's Church of the Nativity, a look at one of Christmas's favorite carols, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and a behind-the-scenes look at the making of Olive Wood Nativity sets. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. We're taking a break this week from the political and other Middle East developments to bring you a special show on Christmas in the Holy Land. We're here in Jerusalem and just a few miles away lies Bethlehem and the Church of the Nativity where many people believe Jesus Christ was born. It's one of the oldest churches in the world. The Church of Nativity was built over this place in 326 when Emperor Constantine decided to declare Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Since then, pilgrims from all around the world started coming to Bethlehem to visit the, this place. Inside the church, the original columns from the 4th century still stand. Constantine's mother, Queen Helena, built the church. But why would she build it here? We do know that the identification of the site of where Jesus was born already traditionally goes back to the middle of the first century uh, AD at least. In the first century, the Roman Emperor Hadrian destroyed the town of Bethlehem. After he destroyed the town, Hadrian built a temple and planted a grove of trees over the site where Christian pilgrims had come to honor the place where Jesus was born. What was left of the house, which was only a cave, where the Virgin gave birth to the child. And people remembered this, and people already within 15 years were going back to that site to visit it. This temple, instead of uh, uh, destroying the place, preserved the place. Jerome wrote in 396 AD, even amongst those who are strangers to the faith, it is known that inside that grotto, he who is adored and glorified by the Christians was born. Through the centuries, the church itself went through a number of changes, but it's still one of the few churches in the Holy Land that was never completely destroyed. 1,400 years after Queen Helena built the church, Christian pilgrims still come from around the world. Many record their personal pilgrimage, both inside and outside the church. The central place lays inside the grotto. Many believe it's the very cave where Jesus was born. A star marks the exact location. Many crowd down the narrow stairs to get inside the cave. Pilgrims often touch the star and record the moment they got to see the birthplace of Jesus. For many, it's a profound emotional and spiritual experience. What did it mean to be at the birthplace of Jesus? Uh, something I cannot describe. I mean, everything makes sense and no words. Now when I open my Bible, as I do each morning when I'm here and I'm reading, uh, it's well, now I can picture the places. It's just awesome. Father Peter Vasco leads pilgrims to Bethlehem. He says it's especially meaningful during the Christmas season. I think it's an absolute wonderful occasion for pilgrims to come, especially so close to Christmas, uh, to be here to pray at, at the spot where Jesus was born and to bring that prayer back in their own lives. But another event recorded in the Bible took place yes. after Jesus was born. Professor Shamali gave us a rare look underneath the Church of the Nativity. Yes. This is the place where we have the tomb of the innocent children. Mm -hmm. Herod killed around 6,000 children from the whole area in order to kill Jesus Christ mm -hmm. because he don't want to have a new king that will replace him. We followed Professor Shamali down to some of the tombs below the church. Here are the tombs of the innocent children. These are the bones of some of the children that we believe were killed by Herod. But another significant event took place just outside Bethlehem. Pastor Steve Corey, a local pastor, showed us caves many believe were used by the shepherds on that holy night. Luke 2, 8 through 11 says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. 
He is Christ the Lord. According to history, shepherds would use these caves to store the sheep during the winter, uh, to store their food in the, in the caves, and also places to live uh, with them. You know, the, the shepherds were very close to their sheep. Those shepherds became the first witnesses to the fulfillment of a prophecy given 700 years before, when Isaiah proclaimed, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Today, that Christmas message is still the same for pilgrims, professors, and pastors. The reminder that God himself came to earth to die on the cross and to be born in a, in a manger. And this is the essence of it, is that people's lives are changed. People's lives will be changed if they hear about Jesus Christ. Christmas is a reminder of the power of Jesus Christ to change lives. And one Christmas carol, my favorite, O Come, Come, Emmanuel, sums up that power. Here's Claire Fawn from the University of the Holy Land explaining the significance of that song, performed by violinist Maurice Sklar in Jerusalem's St. Anne's Church. O Come, Come, Emmanuel is really a beloved hymn, and most people don't realize that this hymn was composed to be an Advent song, not a Christmas carol at all. Each one is based on one of the titles of the Messiah, that is found in the Old Testament. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Emmanuel, of course, is the title given to the Messiah in Isaiah chapter seven, where Isaiah prophesies that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and will call his name Emmanuel. The Gospel of Matthew applies this very scripture to Jesus at his birth. Another one of the titles applied to the Messiah that was adapted into the song is the Rod of Jesse. O come thou Rod of Jesse, come. The Rod of Jesse is referred to in Isaiah chapter 11. And the Rod of Jesse refers, of course, to the kingship, to the ruling. Jesse was the father of David. And so when we sing of the Rod of, of Jesse, we're singing of the descendant of David, the Messiah, Jesus. One of the verses calls for the day spring from on high to arise. O come thou day spring, come and cheer our hearts. The day spring refers to Malachi chapter four, where we read that the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. This verse does not refer as much to the kingship of the Messiah, but it refers to his tenderness to his personalness, to his compassion for those who are weary, for those who suffer and toil, for those who are ill, crying out that the day spring, the Son of Righteousness will come with healing, not only for our bodies, but for our hearts, our souls, and our spirits. Many of the titles that are used in the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, come from the book of Isaiah. Another one is the Key of David. O come thou Key of David, come and open up the way to our heavenly home. The key of David comes from Isaiah 22, and it speaks of, of that opening to passage, to freedom of access, that is echoed in the book of Revelation, when Jesus, in the book of Revelation, gives the key of David, which opens doors that no man can shut. Another very beautiful theme that is touched on in the hymn is when they refer to the Messiah as the Lord of Might. The Lord of Might, of course, comes from Isaiah when it speaks in Isaiah chapter 11 that upon him will rest the spirit of counsel and wisdom and might and understanding. But the hymn reflects on the Lord of Might as being the one who gives the word of the Lord. On Sinai's height gave the law. And of course, the word of the Lord is not simply the law, but it's really Jesus himself, Jesus is the word of God. The song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, is evoking that longing and expectation that we have. We celebrate that Jesus has already come, but we know that something is not yet complete. So it's a very beautiful song because it, it has an echo of the past, but a tremendous anticipation of that glorious coming when the rod of Jesse, the key of David, the one who is almighty, God with us, will establish his kingdom on earth. God who became Jesus, who showed his love for us in laying down his life, 
who calls me by name, who calls each of us by name, who loves us as a father, who loves us as a shepherd, who loves us as a king. Today he cries out for the salvation of each human being. Today is the day of salvation. We don't have to wait till tomorrow. We can celebrate Emmanuel, God with us today. Coming up, we'll hear the story of George Friedrich Handel and his timeless work, The Messiah. Welcome back. One musical composition that's played a lot during the Christmas season is Handel's Messiah. CBN's Mark Martin traveled to London to find out more about this devout Christian composer and his work that transcends time. To learn more about the gifted composer of Messiah, our journey takes us to Europe. German-born George Frederick Handel moved into this house on Brook Street in London, England in his late 30s. Handel considered himself an opera composer, but public interest was waning in England, and by 1741, a discouraged Handel wondered if retirement was near. Some people do think that, that um, at this point he was, it was kind of like a, a career crisis, really, and that it's quite possible that he was thinking of returning to Germany. That's when this man, Charles Jennings, handed him the words or libretto of Messiah. Jennings, a literary scholar, carefully selected Old and New Testament scriptures documenting prophecies about the Messiah, Jesus' birth, death on the cross, and resurrection. The Christian message is, is in part also a response to the kind of growing interest in what is known as deism. Since the deists did not believe in the divinity of Christ, Jennings sought to counter that thinking. We find uh, Jennings writing to another friend of his, uh, saying, uh, I've done this scripture collection for Handel, and I hope he will expend his best efforts on it so that it becomes his best oratorio, because it's certainly on the best subject. The subject is Messiah. Here is Handel's composition room, where he is believed to have composed Messiah. He wrote the oratorio in only 24 days. Many believe it was divinely inspired. One music scholar described the number of errors in the 259-page score as incredibly low for a composition of its length. Handel reportedly never left his house during those three weeks, and a friend who visited discovered him sobbing with intense emotion. After he wrote the Hallelujah Chorus, reports quote him as saying, I did think I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself. For Jennings and Handel, Messiah would be an evangelistic tool to share the gospel with the masses. They even made the controversial decision to perform Messiah in theaters instead of churches to reach a wider audience, including the performers themselves. Handel used secular singer-actresses to perform the solos, such as Susanna Maria Sibber, a woman with an adulterous past, but who was described as being able to penetrate the heart with her voice, when other more skilled vocalists could only reach the ear. He touches people on every possible level, whether it be on a spiritual level or, or musical level or dramatic level. There's something in Messiah for everybody and, and of course for an audience. If you look at the YouTube flash mob hallelujah choruses, you will see that hits are currently running at about 43 million. Now, I doubt if all those people are Protestant Christians. And if you just watch some of those flash mob hallelujahs, you can see in, you know, the people listening in the shopping mall and so on, you can see the change coming over their faces as they listen, and they are greatly moved. Performances were often benefit concerts to help release people from debtor's prison and provide for orphans in London's well-known Foundling Hospital. One scholar wrote, Messiah has fed the hungry, clothed the naked, fostered the orphan, more than any other single musical production in this or any country. However, George Frederick Handel did not want the credit. At the end of Messiah, Handel wrote the letters SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, which means to God alone the glory. Mark Martin, CBN News, London. The fact that Handel would give the glory to God alone is a testament to his devout faith. It's also likely he'd be pleased that his composition has been translated and performed in Hebrew, the language of the Bible. In fact, it was performed in the Scottish church right behind us. 
CBN's Julie Stahl has that story. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The music is familiar, but the words, probably not. Handel's Messiah debuted in 1742 in English. Now that story is being told in Hebrew. When you know the, the meaning of the words in another language, it's not the same when uh, that uh, hearing in your own language. Uh, it touches much more the heart. Translating the Messiah was the idea of 91-year-old Irene Levy who carried the vision for 30 years. I heard a choir here singing once from Norway. All the time they were singing it, I was hearing it in Hebrew. And now tonight I was crying that it was done. Soloist and head of the liturgical choir, David Loden, says this version is more faithful to the Hebrew scriptures than the original. So we have made a choice to try and maintain as much possible the original um, Hebrew renditions of those particular scriptures. Many Israelis and Jewish music lovers enjoy traditional Christian music, but this is one of the first times they can hear it in their native tongue. We hear the responses after this, uh, after the performances in Hebrews, and they are amazing to hear that how much they really, for the first time, understand uh, what is the, the the spirit and the message of what uh, Handel uh, and the Bible is saying. Like Handel, I want to say as he finished his manuscript and wrote on it, Sola Dei Gloria, I want to say all glory be to the Lord. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, it's also the season for Hanukkah for the Jewish people. A look at the Festival of Lights. For eight days, Jewish people around the world celebrate Hanukkah, a holiday marking a great victory more than 2,000 years ago. CBN News visited the old city of Jerusalem to meet one family and take a look at the festive lights. Thousands of Israelis come to Jerusalem's old city at Hanukkah to celebrate and see the lights. All over the world, Jews say special prayers, thanking God for miracles past and present, and light a special candelabra or menorah called a Hanukkah for eight days. This is a holiday about spirituality. This is a holiday about um, values. This is a holiday about connecting to God. So many Israelis come here. Everybody's attracted to the light. Also known as the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah is not mentioned in the Old Testament, but it is in the New Testament. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. CBN News joined Rebecca Spiro and her family for the Jewish celebration. It's a holiday that celebrates religious freedom, and our victory against oppression, and our ability to rededicate the temple. And her children? The presents and the parties and the lot clubs. We have groups to come and go all the time, and we go on trips, and, and it's fun, and it's just fun. In the second century BC, the Jewish people in Judea revolted against the Syrian Greek conquerors. The Seleucids tried to impose their culture, forcing the Jews to eat pork and forbidding Sabbath observance, Torah reading, and circumcision. Worse still, the Seleucids defiled the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and dedicated it to the Greek god Zeus. Led by a priestly family known as the Maccabees, the Jewish people retook Jerusalem and rededicated the temple. But when they wanted to light the menorah, there was only a tiny bit of sacred olive oil left. We celebrate the eight days that the menorah burned, which is miracle, it was beyond nature, and also the um, military victory. Eating fried foods like potato pancakes and jelly donuts is another Hanukkah tradition. Spiro's family and neighbors also have their own personal tradition to build unity between secular and religious Israelis. We every single year we bring out a table of drinks and we thousands of people come to, to the old city for Hanukkah to, to look, look around and see the menorahs and the uh, light and then we, we give out um, uh, hot drinks to all, all the people that come. Spiro says there's a message in the holiday for today. The world's coming up against Israel, the wolves are circling the sheep. Um, this is nothing new, and the message of Hanukkah is that just, no matter what happens, our candles burn bright, and like 
Uh, civilizations have come and gone, but the Jewish people are still here. Up next, a behind the scenes look at the making of Olivewood Christmas scenes. Welcome back to this special edition of Christmas in the Holy Land. Have you ever received an olive wood carving or a nativity set from Bethlehem? We went to one olive wood shop that's been carving Christmas scenes for generations. Ashraf Jaraisay has been working in this olive wood workshop since he was a boy, inheriting an art passed from generation to generation. This uh, workshop, it's come from father to son. There is no school to learn this job. It's also what's come from your inside, from your heart. Most of Duraisay's carvings represent the scenes and characters from the Bible. I feel like the Holy Spirit come inside me and I am always, I am happy with Jesus. His main carvings are nativity scenes. He's produced a number of different styles, but all celebrating the same event, the birth of Jesus. They're all made from the olive wood tree, the biblical symbol of peace. Jeraise showed us how one piece of wood can become a Christmas scene. First, he cuts the wood. Next, he sands it to make it smooth. Then, with the skill honed from 35 years of carving, he cuts by hand small figures representing the characters of the nativity. Finally, he writes a personal greeting. His carvings and the ones he sells have gone all over the world from the United States to Europe and South America. He hopes they're an incentive for people to come and see for themselves the land where Jesus was born. I hope you see you here in the Holy Land to come and to see where Jesus is born and where he is walk and when he is live here. His carvings make special gifts at Christmas. The real meaning of Christmas to, to, to go to the church and to pray for Jesus and to born again to clean everything inside, to become a new person. Christmas is a season of salvation. Well, that's it for this edition. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. Happy Hanukkah to our Jewish friends and Merry Christmas from the Holy Land.